All right, Buenos Dias, mis amigos. All right, today I'm going to talk about this comment from Scattering Seeds. We have been having a great conversation, and uh, it's it's great when somebody engages um, and presents an opposing viewpoint, which this gentleman is doing, and he's doing a really good job in it, and it's going to help me for sure, and I'm, I'm hoping it, it'll help him as well. So let's. I want to take this opportunity to try to help you, the viewer, um, to bring some clarity and to strengthen your faith in the Word of God. So, uh, my friend, uh, Scattering Seeds, he says, You keep saying that when Christ returns, that it is the end of the world, but I have yet to hear one scripture that confirms that not one alright so let's get into that and uh, let's try to find uh, somewhere in the scripture where it says that when Jesus returns it's the end of the world alright so I'm gonna start here in Matthew 24 um, it's just to me you know it's one of my uh, favorite parts of the Bible I guess I just have fond memories of being really excited when I was first a believer and I first started to uh, you know read Matthew 24 because I started out reading the the book of John and I highly recommend for any new believer to start there right, but once once I, after I got done reading the book of John I went to I went back and started the book of Matthew and here you know I'm getting in I'm getting into it now right and so here in verse 3 it says and he sat upon the Mount of Olives the disciples came unto him privately saying tell us when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world so to me this is here we're seeing um, something that is referencing prophecy something that's gonna happen in the future and that's you know big part of why I was so interested in the Bible to begin with you know what is the future you know if you believe you're a super monkey that you evolved from a monkey then logically speaking you're gonna evolve the next step would be to evolve into a little green man well it took me a long time to, to realize I'm not very smart you gotta keep that in mind I'm not a smart man I certainly you think I'm dumb now you should have known me 20 years 20 30 how I'm getting old now 35 years ago right boy oh boy was I dumb and I thought, you know, I'm going to evolve into a green little man. But then it, it started to dawn on me that, hey, this, something ain't right. And, um, so, you know, I kept, you know, obviously, always looking for the truth, searching, searching, searching. And I thought, well, you know what? I, I was 25 years old. I thought, I'm going to. figure out what the Bible says and I'm gonna prove the Bible wrong and I'm gonna show by you know by proving it wrong I'm gonna be able to teach people the truth and well the Bible proved that I was wrong okay now that's what led me to reading the Bible is trying to prove it wrong but then once it proved me wrong then I started getting interested because I knew the Bible had prophecies of the future and so here we get a great prophecy of the future from Jesus you know, you can forget about Nostradamus and all those other 
prophets and Orson Welles and those guys you can forget about all those so-called prophets and just look at the Word of God and see what the Word of God says and here specifically we have Jesus giving us a prophecy of the future and so when he's asked this question what is the sign of thy coming and of the, of the end of the world I get extra excited all right now think about this what shall be the sign of thy coming you know when he comes in the clouds of heaven and of the end of the world so when he comes in the clouds of heaven it's the end of the world they recognize this and they're asking for the signs of this what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world they already recognize it's the same thing when he comes in the clouds of heaven it's the end of the world you see that right and so our friend he says you keep saying that when Christ returns that it is the end of the world right here these guys already knew it because it's all throughout the Bible alright so let's solidify this in Matthew 24 and then I will go into the Old Testament I guess we'll just go throughout the Bible we'll see where we go I don't know where I'm going with this so anyways uh, the very first thing he says is take heed that no man deceive you well what's what happened scattering seeds what happened to you man you let all these men deceive you and you should have known just by reading this one verse alone even not even the whole verse just half the verse what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world this alone tells you that when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven it is the end of the world Jesus answered and said take heed that no man deceive you for many shall come in my name saying I Jesus am Christ and shall deceive many that's the very first warning that he gives and then he goes through all these other things that are gonna happen he says don't don't worry about it this is you know these things need be right they need to happen but then he talks about the sun being darkened and the moon should not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken that alone should tell you it's the end of this world and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven that's Jesus and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn why why would they mourn because they all know instinctively that it's the end of the world it's the way God has made us he has made each and every creature man and beast your dog and cat everybody's gonna know when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven it's the end of the world there's not gonna be any doubt about it whatsoever all the tribes of the earth mourn in Luke 21 it talks about men's hearts failing them for fear people are gonna have heart attacks because they know it is the end of this world and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet and that sound of a trumpet is signifying you know da da da, da it's the end of this world and they shall gather together his elect <clears throat> from the four winds of and from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other all right so that's it all right and then he, he starts to go into parable and he says some other things but that's the end of the world right there <laughs> that's, that's not half time that's not end of the first quarter that's the end of the game game over all right 
should be pretty obvious. All right, so we got this in, in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. Same thing. Same question asked, same answer given. All right, so let's go, um, you know, let's go, um, let's see here. So this idea that um, Jesus comes and it's the end of the world, the sun being darkened, the moon, the moon should not give her light, all this is should, could have been figured out, theoretically, I reckon. But I mean, it's there logically. When you read Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, when the Lord says to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. All right, so there's going to be enmity, they're going to be opposing one another. You got the good guys and the bad guys, you got the saved and the unsaved. Right. So So um let me check something here real quick. Alright, so think about that. In the team between thee and the woman, okay, so there's this opposing these two sides oppose each other okay all right and so if you once you realize that okay there's the good guys and the bad guys and here it says it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Alright, so this alone tells us that <clears throat> the Messiah, the Christ, is going to destroy all evil. It shall bruise thy head. And understanding the serpent represents all that is evil not of God and that thou shalt bruise his heel represents God in all that is good so understanding this you ought to understand that this is going to happen at the end of this world that we just read about God creating all right, so God created the world and in six days and then rested on the seventh and then we get the story of Adam and Eve in chapter 2 and then in chapter 3 we see what happens at the end of this world that God has created in chapter 1 Right, and at the end of this world is when God stomps his foot on the head of the serpent, destroying everything that is evil forever and ever. Now, remember, the conversation they're having about eating from the tree of good and evil and the result of eating from that tree of good and evil that will ultimately lead to the end of the world because we have knowledge of good and evil we must suffer and because we must suffer we don't suffer we do not suffer cannot suffer in vain 
So we suffer until judgment. All right, because there has to be um, an account made for all this suffering of God's people. And so when this happens, when the time is up, the punishment is due, then God stomps his foot on the head of the serpent, destroying all evil forever and ever. And this is echoed all throughout the Bible. So, you know, I, I've done the, I sometimes I do this so much that I think I don't need to do it, but I need to do it because there might be somebody who's watching for the first time, somebody that might be an a young believer, right? In Psalm 110, the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So this is a reference to what we just read in Genesis 3. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel till I make thine enemies thy footstool and I haven't oh no what happened there oh goodness sakes what in the world just happened there oh for dog's sakes here what happened oh I know it didn't it didn't take huh let's try this again Right there, Psalm 110, I just read that. Matthew 22, the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. All right, in Mark 12, it's echoed again. Luke 20, again. Hebrews, chapter 1, is asking the question in ref point, you know, it's in, um, it's in, reference or uh, in relation to that very thing he's talking about the angels here in Hebrews chapter 1 but it's in relation to the idea which of the angels did he say at any time sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool none of them So, again, we can go to, there are a lot of places we can go to. This is echoed all throughout the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. And Revelation chapter 3, verse 9, Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. This goes back to what we read here in Genesis 3. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. See, we're going to be up in the air with the Lord. So when Jesus stomps his foot on the head of the serpent, we are up in the air with him. We are up in the air with him. All right, because we are of his seed. Once we are gathered up, then his foot is stomped on the head of the serpent. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. Once again. Let me get there. Till he has put all enemies under his feet. Right? So, think about this. Are you an enemy of God? Then, if you're not, you're not going to be under his feet. 
if you're not under his feet then you're up in the air with the Lord you're up in the air with the Lord so when it says it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel we're up in the air with the Lord and the Lord and us stomp our feet on the head of the serpent so at the end of the world God is gonna make them to come before our feet they're gonna be gathered at our feet we're gonna be up in the air and at that moment in time they're gonna know that God loves us and that God is going to destroy them. And this is echoed all throughout the Bible. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So you're you're asking, oh, I don't see any You keep saying that Christ returns, that it is the end of the world, but I have yet to hear one scripture that confirms that. This is echoed all throughout the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. When Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, it is the end of the world. Now in 1 Corinthians 15, and this is such a great chapter. Or since by man came death talking about Adam by man came also the resurrection of the dead talking about Jesus for as in Adam all die even so in Christ shall all be made alive but every man in his own order Christ the first fruits afterward they that are Christ at his coming when he comes in the clouds of heaven afterward they that are Christ at his coming then comes the end so when Christ comes, it is the end. All right, so it, so you're asking, you have yet to see one scripture that confirms that. How can you ask that if you've ever read the Bible? Have you never read the Bible? You're quoting Bible verses, but you're missing it. And I, I don't know why. In Harvest, and I'm sorry, in, in Matthew 13, Jesus talks about the parable of the wheat and the tare. All right, and I'd love just to sit here and read the whole thing to you. But I'm going to encourage you to read it. Alright, so he gives the parable of the wheat and the tares. And he explains the parable in great detail, really. I mean, there's it's not rocket science. It's pretty simple. If you're a farmer, you understand the harvest. You understand how you, you know, you have to let the weeds grow with the, with the crop. Now, that's why they they spray to try to kill the weeds yeah, we can, I don't want to get into a discussion on that but the point is that they <laughs> I got too many thoughts on that but the point is that they they grow together All right, but then when it comes to harvest time then everything is uprooted All right, so the harvest is the end of the world. All right, so the crop or the wheat is the saved and the 
terrors are the unsaved. This happens at the end of the world. And so you see here at the end of the world the angels gather together the wheat right where does it say here somewhere that the angels are the reapers oh goodness sakes I, I don't remember it said, it said it somewhere oh right there the, and the reapers are the angels so the angels are going to gather together the wheat all right and just like what we read in Matthew 24 the angels gather together his elect at the end of the world so at the end of the world is when Jesus comes in the clouds and the angels gather together the elect and the terrors are burned right? and the, therefore the terrors are gathered and burned so the terrors are the unsaved and they are gathered and burned in Revelation 20 at the end of the thousand years the terrors are gathered and they are burned The terrors are gathered and burned, and so shall it be in the end of this world. Alright, so it should be obvious. Uh, we, I mean, how many more? places do we need to go? I mean, this is all throughout the Bible. Let's, um, I'll try to make, I won't get into this too much, I reckon. Let's do it this way. Let's just go to Joel. Joel talks about the earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining, the sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord come so this is great and terrible this is talking about the day of the Lord the great day of the Lord when he comes in the clouds of heaven the sun shall be dark and the moon shall not give her light the stars shall fall from heaven the powers of the heaven shall be shaken and then shall Jesus appear in the clouds of heaven. And this is all throughout the Bible. In Genesis, or I'm sorry, in Revelation chapter 1, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Alright, so he comes in the clouds of heaven. And every eye shall see him. And Joel talks about this great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Alright, so when this happens, it's the end of the world. When Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven and stomps his foot on the head of the serpent destroying all evil forever this is prophesied 
all throughout the Bible from Revelation I'm sorry from Genesis to Revelation and we're putting our hope into this world that is to come an everlasting world where there is no more evil well, that's what we're putting our hope in we're putting our hope into this fact that God will stomp his foot on the head of the serpent destroying all evil that's our hope for everlasting life forever and ever Now, in Revelation 21, it says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. All right, so there, in this chapter, we're learning about a, the world to come. When you have a new earth, that means the old earth is done away with. The old world is done away with. A new heaven and a new earth. And consider this. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God. So New Jerusalem is up in the heaven right now. It's not on the earth. The city of God, the new, the Jerusalem that we read so much about, it's not on earth. It's in heaven. That's where we're putting our hope into think about Matthew 6 for where your treasure is there will your heart be also so our hope our heart is in this holy city which is in heaven right this Jerusalem the holy city of God is in heaven it's not on earth right now so Jerusalem which is above is free and the mother of us all the holy city of God is in heaven that's where our heart is that's where our hope is and so at the end of the world the new city comes down out of heaven and there's a new heaven and a new earth and all the evil that this world go that we go through in this world it's gonna be done away with and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death there shall be no more death In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. And we'll scroll down here a little bit. Talking about the end of the world, the last drop, and we shall be raised. So, when we have been transformed into our glorified bodies, and all evil is destroyed forever when all evil is destroyed forever right this is when all evil is destroyed forever and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death 1st Corinthians 15 and then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory all right when death is swallowed up in victory and there's no more sorrow no crying neither shall there be any more pain it's the end of the old this world and the beginning of a new world a world without end an everlasting world that last forever and ever and ever and ever 
that's what we're putting our hope into and that's what is prophesied here in Genesis 3 verse 15 I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed and it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel and when this happens that's it no more evil so you see this thing is foretold all throughout the Bible and it could have been understood by this one simple verse in Genesis chapter 3 just from a logical standpoint this has to happen this world has to come to an end there is a separation between good and evil and evil is going to get destroyed and then when this happens then he that sat upon the throne that's Jesus he's gonna say behold I make all things new And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. God Almighty is true and faithful. So I hope I've answered that question. I really do. Because this idea that when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven and that it is the end of the world this is echoed all throughout the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and when he comes that's it that is it and this is all throughout the Bible. I can go on. I can go on and on. And on. I'm not going to. I'm going to end it right here. But it's obvious. All throughout the Bible. Okay? All throughout the Bible. It's foretold that Jesus is coming in the clouds of heaven. I mean, it is all throughout the Bible. It's, it's incredible, man. It's incredible. I, but, you know, once you, you have to have eyes to see it right you have to have you don't have to be smart I'm, I'm evidence of that you just have to have eyes to see you have to believe the Bible that you hold in your hands believe that they are directly from God because they are right again here in John chapter 14 if I go and prepare a place for you I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there ye may be also he's coming in the clouds of heaven and when he comes it's the end of the world we're gonna be drawn up with him and when this happens it's the end of the world I feel like I could go another hour I could go hours on this because it's it's everywhere everywhere in the Bible it talks about Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven and it's the end of the world at the end of the world meet the Lord in, in the air at the end of the world it's all throughout the Bible it's incredible And I, I didn't even go to Mark 13 and Luke 21. It's in there's, and in the book of Revelation, there's a whole bunch of places, right? In Isaiah, there's a whole bunch of places. There's a couple places, and there, well, there's more than two, but it's incredible how often this is repeated over and over and over and over. From Genesis to Revelation when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven 
it is the end of the world and this is a big deal because the my big thing is here you cannot have unsaved people living after Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven because it's the end of the world right it's the end when all evil is destroyed so you cannot have evil people living after all evil has been destroyed it, it just contradicts everything that is in the Bible alright so hopefully this helps somebody um, to me it's incredible man I mean it's absolutely incredible the guy doesn't know nothing and you got this guy <laughs> I was gonna go over these things, but none of these guys—they know—they don't know anything. It's incredible. It's like nobody cares about the truth anymore. You know, look at this. This is weird. Calvary, Tucson. Why are they starting at verse 11? It, Revelation 20 has 15 verses. It takes what three minutes to read it. So why are you skipping two thirds of the the chapter? when it all fits together as one well it's because they don't understand it now this is the odd thing here you got this scheduled right from this church Calvary Tucson Tucson Arizona I assume and then a scheduled so I guess today or tomorrow or whatever I don't, I don't know it doesn't matter and then look at this the River Life Church <clears throat> They're starting at verse 11. Why? What's going on here? Why would two churches in the same 24 hour period talk about this? What's going on here? It's weird. And here's another one Free Grace Bible Church. Again, Revelation 20, verse 11. Why? Why are you starting in there? It doesn't make any sense to me. There's another one, Walnut Hill Watery Campus. And this is all within a day. Are they getting their marching orders from somebody? Or is this just a coincidence? I don't get it, man. I really don't get it. But I hope you get it. I really do. Because quite frankly, um, if you don't get it now, um, you might get it later. 